Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I welcome you to All Saints on this, uh, what's going to be a very happy occasion, as all weddings are. This is going to be not just one wedding, but many weddings. And I look forward very much to seeing the progression and the uh, different clothes that are go ha have been worn over the century or so that this time covers. Our thanks go very much to the History Club for organizing this and for making it possible on this millennium event to have something as unusual. Um, it is very unusual to have this sort of event and um, I personally look forward very much to all that is going to happen tonight. I must start with an apology from my wife. She had hoped to be here tonight but in the words of the prophet, the uh, uh, best laid plans of mice and men are apt to go awry. And uh, tonight particularly, they have gone very much awry in the house. And she's been left with a painter painting, uh, an electrician doing electrical work, and two children to look after, which she didn't expect to have to look after either. So she does send her apologies and hopes that you have a very, very happy and enjoyable occasion. It leaves me only one thing further to say, and that is, um, to hand you over to the people who are going to guide us through this pageant, a pageant of clothes, a pageant of customs, a pageant which we all are looking forward to. I hand you over to the people from the historic society, as it were, the History Society, the History Club, Margaret and Mary. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome from the members of Wheatley for the History Club. My name is Mary, and the lady on my left is Margaret. And together it is our pleasure to guide you through our programme this evening. Tonight we will be showing you a very fine display of wedding dresses dated from 1870 to 1990. Why 1870, you may ask? Well, as most of you are aware, 1870 is in fact the year when the colliery was opened here in Wheatley Hill. It seemed very apt, therefore, to begin our pageant at this point. The dresses you are about to see will not reflect the grand finery of the upper class brides of the last century, but are in fact typical of the types worn by the young brides of the many mining villages in our area and more importantly, in your own village here at Wheatley Hill. As we progress through the decades, Margaret will give a brief historical account of the village at the time. I, in turn, will relate some superstitions attached to weddings and also give a description of the wedding dresses and introduce you to our models. So may I ask you to sit back Relax and allow us to transport you back in time to the reign of Queen Victoria. Wheatley Hill Pit opened in 1869 by the Thornley Coal Company at the time when the Franco-Prussian War brought great prosperity to the Durham coal field. A coal hewer at this time earned £1.50 per day and he worked for five days a week. Pork and beef cost tuppence halfpenny and it cost one shilling for 24 eggs and threepence for a pint of beer. The first houses to be built in the village of Wheatley Hill were of the cottage type and were situated over the line at the bottom of Patton Street. On the 19th of January, 1871, water swept through Wheatley Hill Pit from the Thornley side, which killed five men. The Patton Street Methodist Chapel was built in 1873 closely followed by the Nimmo in 1874. Also in 1874, the private coal owners wanted to reduce the wages of the men by 10% in the Durham coal field. This brought about strike action, which lasted a week in every other colliery except Wheatley Hill. Their continued action led to the coal owners employing candy men to evict the miners and their families from their homes. For three weeks, the miners of this village lived in tents on the Thornley Moor. 
There was continuous sunshine during this period, and the families found it quite pleasant. The pit reopened after three weeks, and the men went back to work. In 1877, the colliery was sold to an even more disreputable company, the Hartlepool Coal Company. And in the same year, the first put pay occurred, when the owners hadn't any men, any money to pay the men's wages. In 1877, the first school opened in Wheatley Hill. It cost £3,750 to build and had 69 scholars on its books in 1879. Our first wedding is perhaps a little more, dare I say, classy than you might expect for a village wedding of 1870. However, there is a reason for this. You see, the father of the bride, Mr. Elwood, was in fact the colliery manager at this time. And today he gives his daughter's hand in marriage to her betrothed. His daughter's name was Elizabeth. Tonight, Samantha is the bride in question. And she is wearing a pretty two-piece wedding dress of white nylon and lace. typhoid in this village. Also in this year, the Temperance Hall was built at the bottom of Cotton Street. In 1884, the colliery went bankrupt again, second put pay. This time, the owners offered to sell the tanky in order to raise money to pay the men's wages, but the men didn't trust the owners and pulled up the, ra the rails surrounding the tanky, keeping it in the pound so that it couldn't be moved. The men had no guarantees but even if the tanky was sold, that they would see any of the money. The pit was closed down, and people moved away from the area. Due to the unrest of the pit, children were absent from school and begging in the streets. Marie's dress is of blue flowers on a white background. It has a circular skirt with a foot. The Van Dyke bodice pointed at front is buttoned at the back and has a pretty little frill at the neckline. <clears throat> Wedding dresses were not always in cream or white. Pastel colours were fashionable at this time, blue being favoured the most. Hence the proverb, married in blue, it will always be true. Please notice that the groom George is wearing a favour. These were regularly given to friends and relatives to wear at weddings. They were sometimes called blood knots. Symbolic importance was attached to colours, which brings to mind a phrase from a poem by Edward Chicken entitled, The Colliers' Wedding. Like streams in the painted sky, at every breast the colours fly. The modern day symbol of the favour is, of course, the use of ribbons on a wedding card. Thank you, Marie and George. In 1897, the, the people of Wheatley Hill could have their shopping delivered to their door from the store at Shotton. Also in 1897, the girls' school was started, not in Wordsworth Avenue as we know it today, but in the front street. Our next bride is Joanne. She is wearing a pretty cotton outfit, again favouring pastels. This time in pink and cream. The floral striped jacket has a plain pink yoke and trimmed with lace. The skirt has an apron front. 
A lovely matching hat completes the ensemble. Joanne will be looking to see if a black cat should cross her path today. If so, she should greet the animal with courtesy and stroke it if she can, while saying this charm. Black cat, cross my path. Good fortune bring to home and heart. When I am away from home, bring me luck where'er I roam. But if she should ignore the cat, no good luck charm will be worked on her behalf. Thank you, Joanne. In 1901, Wheatley Hill was described as a joke by Jack Lawson MP. In 1902, Peter Lee became Wayman at the Pit. Also in this year, there was a cage accident resulting in the injury of 23 miners, some very serious. The Wesleyan Chapel was opened in 1903. They had previously held their services in two houses in Ford Street. In 1900s, the Wheatley Hill Colliery Band had their drum put in prison. During a band recital at a neighbouring village, the drum and the drunken drummer became separated and the drum spent the night in the cells at Thornley Police Station. In 1904, the Working Men's Club opened over the Beck. It is a separate skirt and blouse in white fancy on the face. It is a typically homemade dress and is the style which a village bride of 1900 would have worn. After the wedding, this dress would then most certainly have been used as a Sunday best outfit for going to church or chapel. The style of the outfit is very simple but is complemented by this wonderfully wide brimmed hat. And there are no prizes for guessing why the bride should be wearing a black hat. There has obviously been a recent death in the family, and the black hat is simply a sign of respect. <laughs> Note the posy of wild flowers. No florist's bouquet for this bride. The flowers would have been freshly picked from the garden on the morning of her wedding. Margaret will now give you a brief narrative about our chimney sweep. There is some association with chimney sweeps at weddings bringing good luck. This association goes back at least 400 years when sweeps were closely linked to witches, both having the besom broom in common. Early sweeps, probably in the 1700s, often dressed in women's clothing, as it was thought to be unlucky for men to be seen doing housework. Sweeps were also in much demand to lead May Day processions, especially in country areas. As no one wanted their chimneys sweeping during the summertime, sweeping became a seasonal job, leaving the poor old sweep and his family without any income for approximately four weeks in the year, sorry, four months in the year. In London, the sweeps would dress in their working clothes and with their brushes beg on the streets in an attempt to obtain money to feed their families. In the north of England, however, the sweeps were much more sophisticated and found that if they turned up at a wedding in their chimney sweeping clothes, they were often given money as people associated the sweep with a good luck token. Our sweep tonight is a real one and he's chosen to wear men's clothing. <laughs> But it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to the year 1910. The next dress is of bloomed white satin and is modelled by Chenin. The lace trim is very complimentary. Notice the straight skirt, almost, I think, like the infamous hobble skirt, which was very fashionable at the turn of the century. This style completely vanished with the onset of the First World War. 
On researching the superstitions attached to weddings, the most amusing one for me was this next one. Did you know that if you should meet an elephant on the way to your wedding, that's considered good luck? <laughs> I kid you not, I, this, is what was, this is what I read in a book, right? So it's just as well in the absence of an elephant or two in Weekly Hill that the horseshoe is considered just as lucky. It is common even today for a bride to carry a horseshoe and horseshoe shapes are found on wedding cakes, in confetti, and illustrated on wedding cards. Thank you, Shanine. On the 24th of September, 1910, the new Miners Hall in Patton Street was opened. The building cost £1,700 to build. Magic lantern shows were held there, and it cost one penny to get in. In 1912, the Sherburn Hill Cooperative Society opened a store on the Thornley Road. In 1912, a new infants of school was opened by Peter Lee, County Councillor. The school had places for 442 pupils. In 1914, a team from Wheatley Hill won the Trimden and District Football League Cup. In 1914, the First World War broke out and many men and boys from this village went away to fight for their country. Many never returned. Harold Lee, son of Peter Lee, fought at the Battle of Jutland and received the George Medal for his bravery. He was referred to in a book by Rudyard Kipling as one of the three wise men to save the ship Spitfire. Another hero of the First World War was Thomas Kenny. He worked at Wheatley Hill Pit from 1927 until he retired. He's buried in Wheatley Hill Cemetery. We now move on to the 1920s. And Jane is wearing a beautiful dress made up of cream silk. Note the train which tapers into a fish tail. The sleeves are long and pointed, and the fringing detail, coupled with the pearl trimmings, makes a dress any girl would die for. Please note the matching headdress. Confetti appeared early in the 20th century and rapidly replaced the throwing of rice. Both these customs signify a fertility right to ensure fruitfulness in marriage. Now this poses the question, if confetti replaced rice, what then I wonder will replace confetti, which is currently being phased out, isn't it? I do know of weddings where the small bridesmaids have blown bubbles as an alternative to confetti. Can this be the trend for the future, I wonder? Our groom, Stephen, is looking very dapper in his outfit and very handsome to boot. Thank you, Jane and Stephen. In 1924, the aged miners' homes were opened. 1925 was a heyday for this village. Low main best was in great demand throughout the country and more men were taken on at the pit. The village began to expand to the west. A scheme was started to encourage miners to buy their own houses. These houses are in South View and East View and are still known by some as the scheme houses. On the 1st of June, 1926, the Welfare Park was opened. In 1927, lightning struck the cage rope at the pit. Peter Lee became chairman of the parish council. He was responsible for introducing a new sewerage system, electricity and a cemetery to this village. Our bride of the 1930s is Amanda and her groom is Stephen. Wedding dresses at this time were influenced by the cinema. Romantic styles of chiffon and lace and silk were favoured, and styles copied to suit the pocket of the wearer. Amanda's dress is of cream muslin. It has a square neck and peclum effect to the front of the bodice. Instead of a floral headdress, this bride's choice is a tiara. Wedding cake is doubtless a development of the primitive practice of eating a special food as part of the marriage rites. 
eating together symbolizes kinship, one of the strongest ties in life. It is still customary today for each guest at a wedding ceremony to take away a piece of cake to ensure plentifulness in all things to the happy couple. Thank you, Amanda and Stephen. Slum clearing started and 357 houses were involved in 1930s. 357 housing 371 families. In 1933, the last handball championship in England was held at the Colliery Inn in Lynn Terrace. In 1934, the Crow's House seam closed at the pit. 400 men were laid off. In 1935, Peter Lee died and was buried in Wheatley Hill Cemetery. His funeral was a day to remember in this village. In 1938, the Workmen's Club relocated from over the Beck to Quills Road, where it remains today. In 1938, the Palace Cinema had a refurbishment and reopened as the Royalty, and a new cinema opened in Quillstyle Road called the Regal. Also in 1938, the old tavern, which was on the site of the Wingate Lane post office, closed down, and the new tavern was opened on the opposite side of the road. 1939 saw the official opening of the pit baths and an outbreak of the Second World War. We now move to 1940, and due to the war, fashion came to a standstill, more so than in the First World War. From 1945, however, discharge from the services meant that there was a spate of white weddings. But the bride who wore our next dress, modelled by Izzy, had very different ideas. This is actually one of my favourite dresses and would, I'm sure, be the envy of any bride even today. The simplicity of the design is lifted by the use of turquoise floral lace. I love the sweetheart neckline, which actually came into fashion in 1937 and stayed with us until the late 1940s. The pleated detail on the front of the bodice has been very cleverly worked and the dress boasts a full circular skirt with a taffeta underskirt. The dainty little straw hat is blue-grey in colour and is decorated with a spray of flowers. The outfit is completed with a pair of short crochet gloves, which the bride's forgotten. <laughs> we continue with the 1940s, and dress two, in contrast, is worn by Pamela, and it favours a, a long cream silk style. It has a wonderfully embroidered yoke with cut out detail and a matching embroidered peclum front. The long sleeves are gathered into the shoulder, tapering to a point at the wrist. It is a truly exquisite dress. So very different to the dress just worn by Izzy, isn't it? Yet it's the same decade. Thank you, Pamela and Matty. In 1940, 94 council houses were completed. And in 1942, the pit canteen opened. Many men and boys left the village to fight in the war, and of those who stayed at home, many took part in necessary work, such as the Home Guard, firefighting, St John's Ambulance, air raid wardens and special police. In 1940, during a daylight raid on England, hundreds of incendiary bombs were dropped on Wheatley Hill, and the men in these services did a tremendous job in minimising the damage they caused. 1st of January, 1947, Nationalisation Day, the day the pits were taken out of the hands of private owners and operated by the government. 
There were great celebrations across the coal field. However, in 1949, the number one pit closed due to danger of flood from Thornley. We now have two very different styles for the 1950s. Lindsay opted for a winter wedding and the dress of cream mistletoe satin is very apt for the season. <laughs> Have I missed something? <laughs> the dress has a high plain neckline and a circular skirt. I hope you can see the button detail down the back as our bride progresses around the church. Back detail, of course, being very important in a wedding dress. Lindsay's groom is David. <laughs> They're not in a hurry to get to the altar. told all our brides and grooms to be sure that they don't sign any bits of paper. <laughs> our second dress is worn by Linda, and it's in complete contrast to the dress we have just admired. The short wedding dress became popular in the middle 50s. They were very shapely and worn over short, wide petticoats. Short circular veils were held back off the face. The style of the bridesmaid's dress is followed through for our bridesmaid, Julie, whose dress is in such a pretty shade of lavender. I can see all eyes on our groom here, ladies. Can you believe that our young men of the 50s actually wore these? Stranger still, ladies, didn't we just fall for them? In 1950, Teddy Kane, Czech Wayman at the pit, was invited to Nigeria to advise them on les labor relations. In 1953, the Green Hill seam at the pit closed down. It was exhausted of coal. In 1954, an extension to this parish church was completed. Many men were moving into factory jobs or transferring to pits in other parts of the country particular Nottingham and Yorkshire. Also in 1953, the license was transferred from the Colliery Inn in Lynn Terrace to the new Coronation Hotel in Wordsworth Avenue. In 1954, the police houses were built at the top of Cemetery Road. The 1960s brings three dresses for the price of one, each with a very different appeal. Our first bride is Sarah and her dress is a white lace creation with a train which falls from the waist. The simplicity of the veil is very becoming, coupled against the lace dress. I used to be that thing, you know, a long time ago. It's quite sickening really, isn't it? On second thoughts, I don't think I ever looked like that. She's beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. Our second dress is worn by Cheryl. This is of tree bark satin. It has a floral lace trim on the bodice and sleeves following through to the train. This dress, I'm told, was made by a dressmaker in Whitburn. Cheryl's bridesmaid is Joanne, who is wearing peach satin. An interesting point to note is the uh, floral hair decoration.
Thank you, Cheryl and Joanne. And last but not least is Claire. She is modeling a dress from 1969, which is made of slipper satin. The front of the bodice is adorned with pearls. The train falls from the waist and is edged with lace. And I must mention our very lucky groom, David, who tells me he's wearing his wedding own wedding suit. There's not a lot of men can say they can fit into their wedding suit 30 years on, is there? <laughs> well done, David. <laughs> Thank you, Claire and David. In 1961, the Pajama Factory opened in the Front Street. The Anorak Factory opened in the Old Wesleyan Chapel, and now houses were planned for the area south of Wingate Lane, the houses we now know as the Ponderosa. In 1964, the Wheatley Hill winding engine was 90 years old, and one of the only one of its type left in the country. In 1966, a film called The 26 was filmed in Wheatley Hill, and many people from the village had parts as extras. In 1968, in common with many, Wheatley Hill Pit closed down. Also in 1968, boys' school merged with the girls' school, Mr. Harris took over as head teacher, and Miss Alderslade retired. For the 1970s, we will show you a collection of dresses for both brides and bridesmaids. Our first dress is modelled by Carol. This dress is of 1970. The style is of the Empire line in nylon and lace. The bodice has a typical high waistline, as in the Empire style, and a frilled neckline. The sleeves and cuffs of lace, and noticeable lace trim on the train. The dress is complemented by a short veil. Dress two is from 1975. And Claire is wearing a stunning velvet dress in a very unusual shade of oyster. This dress has truly a period flavor. The train follows through from a high waist and the pearl buttoned bodice has a high neckline. A particular point of note is the Tudor style headdress which has a short cream veil. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> I'm sure you'll agree that Claire's headdress and veil complements the dress admirably. Anna is five years old. Her dress is unusual in that it was actually originally my own wedding dress from 1970. It was made of white crepe and capua lace. However, when my daughter was seven years old and she was to make her first Holy Communion, I thought it might be a nice idea to make her communion dress from my wedding dress. And this was the result. Anna's Juliet cap is covered with white capua lace flowers taken from the dress. And who knows, if one day I should become a grandma, might become a christening robe, mightn't it? Thank you. Our third model is Hazel. She is wearing white chiffon with a full circular skirt. The V neckline lends shape to the bodice. I hope you can see the wonderful lace detail on the bodice and sleeves.
Jasmine is wearing a lovely blue floral dress. Her Juliet cap is made up of yellow flowers to tone with her flower ball. Flower balls were very popular then, weren't they? Doesn't she look pretty? Thank you, Hazel and Jasmine. Absolutely nothing happened in this village during the 1970s because I've got nothing written on my sheet. <laughs> Sorry. Can anyone improvise? <laughs> Sorry. Shall I move on, Margaret? Mm. To the 1980s. She told me nothing happened here in the 1970s. I didn't believe her. And so to the 1980s. Now, from the 1950s to today, white and ivory remains the trend for wedding dresses. Styles have been many and in a range of materials. Adrian's bride is Vicky and she is wearing her own wedding dress, a beautiful satin creation, again in period style. It has a frill detail on the bodice and a high neckline. The full sleeve is narrowed at the wrist and the full skirt is edged with a wide frill. A short veil completes the outfit and I'm sure the bride looks as lovely today as she did on her own special day back in the 1980s. Now to our bridesmaids. Bridesmaids' dresses of the 80s have one thing in common. I think you'll agree they're all beautiful. And so are our bridesmaids. Lisa looks as pretty as a picture in white cotton trimmed with yellow bows. Sophie is in green, which complements her beautiful hair. Notice the rural theme in her headdress, and again in the basket arrangement, which was very apt for the wedding of a farmer's daughter. Abigail's dress of silver grey has lovely smocking on the bodice, and I love the little Peter Pan collar and the crochet gloves, this time very apparent. <laughs> In 1980s, factory workshops were opened on the front street in an attempt to regenerate the centre of this village. A bypass opened to give a better link from the A19 to the motorway at Bowburn, and in 1986, Wheatley Hill was designated as a health black spot the 25th worst place in the country to live. <laughs> Full of joy. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> this now brings us to the final decade of our pageant. Our groom, Colin, will escort his bride, Denise, down the aisle. Hopefully. <laughs> Denise looks stunning in her own bridal gown of white slipper satin. It has a sweetheart neckline, which is built up with lace and trimmed with diamante. The bouffant sleeves are short and trimmed with lace, and the full hoop skirt falls into a magnificently trimmed train. That's what it is to say. This is also edged with lace. The veil and headdress complete the picture. Thank you, Denise and Colin. Our second bride, Lisa, is also wearing her own gown, and she is on the arm of her husband, Graham. The dress is yet another beautiful creation, 
It is made up of raw silk. The bodice is panelled and boned and has a silver and gold shimmer. It is adorned with crystal and gold beads, which also make up the straps. Please notice how these straps drape the arm. The long skirt has a draped apron front and the buttoned back has an interesting detail on the hips. The long veil is held in place with a dull silver coronet. Lisa is also carrying a walking stick decorated with greenery. This is a sign of respect to her grandfather, whose wish it always was to escort her down the aisle. A fitting tribute to her grandfather, I'm sure you'll agree. Our small bridesmaids are Chloe and Levi, and don't they look adorable in cream and navy? Thank you, everyone. invite all our models to return so that you can admire our collection once more. holds for fashion. The clothes may change, but custom, which is the greater part of the tradition, dies hard. People choose their clothes for a wedding with great care, and the choice can be as wide as the world. The clothes will change, but a bride will be a bride now and always. They'll follow the fashions of their own time and place. In all ages, may the world wish them well. This completes our pageant, and I hope we have entertained you and perhaps revived memories of weddings past. 
Before I hand you over to Margaret, it now only remains for me to say thank you for being a truly wonderful audience. May I wish you all a very good night. God bless and a safe journey home. Thank you. The History Club has worked very hard for over a year now to bring about this celebration. Joan Scott, Mary Bowes and Connie Gregory deserve a special mention for the untold hours they've put in to make this event a success. Um, our thanks go to their very patient families who must be pleased that it's all over. Of course, without the award from the National Lottery, we wouldn't be here at all. We've had help from so many people in so many ways who've loaned photographs, dresses, cards, and even cakes. The Wheatley Hill Camera Club have taken photographs. Joan Shutt, the local florist, has worked hard at producing authentic flowers. And Julie, the hairdresser, has been driven demented by our demands of hairstyles through the ages. History Club members have provided lots of unseen work. The Over Twenties Club has provided refreshments. And the church has provided the venue which has received the admiration of many tonight. The models have given up their time willingly, and of course, without them, this production could not have taken place. We are very grateful for everyone who has helped in any way at all. I'd just like to ask Mr. Thubrin to give us the closing words before we leave for our refreshments in the church hall. Thank you, Mr. Thubrin. I'm glad to hear nothing that's when the Thubrin family came to visit. It's always my great privilege to conduct many uh, weddings, and particularly in this church. And uh, of course, one of the, the great joys, of course, is to see that the service goes well. And usually it does. One of my, my pet things was to make sure the choreography went well particularly to make sure that the groom didn't stand on the bride's dress, which I to have a word with that. Uh, of course, you are occasionally had uh, the embarrassing moment. I remember one girl saying to me when I said to her in the rehearsal, at this point, you kneel down. And she whispered to me, because you hadn't told her, her husband to be what kind of dress she was wearing, of course. She said, the dress has these hoops in the back. When I kneel down, the dress will <laughs> so I had a careful word with that mother that night, and I think we saw it about the next day. <laughs> a prayer to remind ourselves of the joy and the wonder of life and of marriage. We thank you, God our Father, for the joys of marriage, for the physical pleasure of bodily union, the rich experience of mutual companionship and family life, and the spiritual ecstasy of knowing and serving Christ together. Help us to respond to your goodness. Be recognized you as the head of our home, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, bringing of our children in faith and godly fear, and offering hospitality to the hopeless. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you now and all whom you love this night and forevermore. Amen. Amen.